Well, some of you may know there are a handful of families at the Mission Church right now that are expecting babies. It's been a fruitful season, and we've got a whole bunch of them coming. I think one's already, uh, already born just last week, and a handful more upcoming. It's, it's really special when that happens. It's special because we just know how amazing it is that people can be born at all, let alone we get to experience that with one another. And in fact, we oftentimes talk about birth as a miracle, do we not? The miracle of birth. But when people say that, we don't mean something unnatural because birth is one of the most natural things that there is. What we mean is that it's so significant that it, it, it's mind-blowing. It's really amazing when you think about it. In fact, when we find out about somebody who is uh, getting ready to have their first child, it's especially uh, significant, isn't it? Because we know, oh man, everything's going to change. You're, you're going to see the experience of it is really pretty amazing. I never forget the uh, first baby born into our home, Bethany. She's our oldest. Uh, it was the night before she'd be born. My wife says, as she's going to bed, you know, I'm, I'm feeling something. I, I, think, I think she may be coming. I go, oh, great. Well, I'm going to go ahead and get good, good sleep right now because who knows what the next few days are going to look like. And we've just been preparing for this for months, and everybody's been telling us what it's going to be like, and all excited and scared and everything. And uh, I slept sound. I slept great. Labor was easy for me. That's all I have to say. It was awesome. <laughs> Woke up in the morning. Uh, wa- her water broke early in the morning, and we're like, well, let's just hang around for a few more hours and see what happens. <laughs> and uh, eventually, we'd, we'd, she finally said, no, we've got to go now. Rush down to the car, get in the car, and we drive our way to the hospital. And I, I get to the front door of the hospital. I drop my wife off. And I go, you wait right there by the front. I'm going to park the car. I'll be right back. Doing my husbandly, fatherly duty, right? Just taking care of, care of my wife and new kid first. By the time I parked the car and got back to the front desk, she was already in a room having the baby. I was like, where's, where's my wife? They're like, oh, uh, she's having a baby. Where? I don't know. You've got to go, go find in a room. So eventually they, they found the room with me. And needless to say, it was a pretty amazing experience. Fourteen minutes after we arrived at the door, we had a baby in our arms. It was, it was incredible. I highly recommend fast labors. So ladies, if you can take that guidance, I think that would be much better for you. Um, I think it was so special, not just because you get to experience it, but it really is amazing. Everything changes. Everything in your life has changed because you were born. And I don't think that that experience is lost on Jesus when in John 3, he uses birth language to describe a person becoming a believer, their conversion. He says to Nicodemus in his famous discourse in John chapter 3, his dialogue, he says, in order to enter the kingdom of God, you must what? Be born again. Now, I think that Jesus could have used any, any bit of different kinds of language to explain what takes place when a person is converted, when they're regenerated. I think he knows that this is especially helpful for us because we notice how dramatic, life-altering birth really is. This is an amazing passage, and we're going to continue in it today. We spent the first week honing in on the language of the kingdom of God. Because he just comes right out of the gate explaining how to get into the kingdom of God. So he talks about what's, what's the kingdom of God. The next week, which was last week, we began to unpack a bit what Jesus was talking about being born again. And he specifically points to birth as a spiritual something that happens according to the Holy Spirit. But his audience here, Nicodemus, the Pharisee with whom he's talking, is still confused by what Jesus is teaching us. I want you to follow me in this this morning. We're just going to read through our text today. We're only going to be covering verses 9 through 13, but I'm going to back up and I'll just read through verses 1 through 13 just so we have the context together. Then I'm going to pray and uh, go back through the text, and the goal today will just be to make a few observations that we can apply in our lives today, okay? So if you have your Bibles, go to John 3. I'll be reading verses 1 through 13. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with them. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? 
Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for your word. We're so grateful that Jesus' perfectly true illustrations, perfectly true words were spoken. And that by the Holy Spirit, you drew these things to the mind of John, the evangelist, to write them down. And throughout history, a million sets of hands and, and ways that you preserved this text for us so that we can read it this morning. Lord, let, let us be grateful for what you've given to us. Lord, let it not just be an interesting research in history, but help it to become in our hearts something that is so alive and helpful for our every day that we embrace it with love and receive it as a good gift from you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pick up in verse 9. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? So here we have Nicodemus expressing that he's still confused. This is his second question. His first question was in regards to Jesus' simple statement about the need to be born again to enter the kingdom or to see the kingdom of God, as he says it there. Here he's still confused. Now the question I'll, I'll offer to you is, what is he asking here? What is the thing that he is finding confusing? Jesus just told him no one can enter the kingdom of heaven unless he's born of the Spirit. And when he says that the moving of the Spirit is like the wind, he explains that it can't be predicted. That the movement of the Holy Spirit can't be controlled. And this is what the new birth is like. We're entirely dependent upon the Spirit of God to act. And Nicodemus is confused by it. How can these things be? How can it be that we are dependent upon the Spirit of God for something as important as this new birth, and we have no control over it? Now, on one hand, it's not at all surprising that Nicodemus, a Pharisee, would misunderstand these things. I want you to remember with me who the Pharisees were and what they were known for. The Pharisees, by Jesus' day, had developed a reputation for reliance upon at least two very specific things. And, and listen carefully to these two things, because what you're going to find is throughout the gospel accounts, one of these two dependent errors continually rises up with the Pharisees. The first error with these Pharisees is their reliance upon their status as ethnic Jews. It happens all over the place. We are sons of Abraham. We're not like the Gentiles. He says this kind of stuff all the time. Nicodemus, being a Pharisee, would have been closely identified with this exact kind of wrong thinking. I unpacked a bit of this in previous weeks. The people that day thought that, hey, I don't need to be born in any other way. I've already been born in the line of Abraham. I can trace it all the way back through Jacob and all the tribes. I even know what tribe I'm part of. A person could rely upon their lineage. That's one problem with the Pharisees. They relied upon their status as ethnic Jews. But perhaps more obvious and more memorable to our minds that the Pharisees became reliant upon their works of the law. That's what they became reliant upon. They were the ones who did good deeds. They scrutinized over parts of the law in order to try to tithe on mint and dill and cumin. They tried to get to the nitty-gritty parts of the law and, and perform. It was a very performance-based Thing for them. They relied upon their works of the law. They even made overtures and statements to that effect repeatedly. 
One of these two errors is at play in almost every interaction between Jesus and the Pharisees. They'll even say, well, we follow the Sabbath. This Jesus fellow doesn't even obey the Sabbath. We do. We wouldn't heal anybody on the Sabbath. Like they could. And Jesus presses on them for this. They were so relying upon the works of the law, they didn't even love God. So I want you to notice, as is commonly the case, Jesus here presses upon the exact two things that are an issue for them. He does this often, doesn't he? He finds the actual issue at heart with that individual he's dealing with, and he presses upon that thing. You might remember his interaction with the rich young ruler, where Jesus is talking to a rich young guy. He's got plenty of funds. He's mostly a righteous living guy. And uh, he asks him what he must do to be a disciple of Jesus. How do I honor God? What, what, what must I do to obey the law? Jesus gives him a list, a short list, a quick summary of obedience to the law. Remember what the rich young man says? He goes, I do those things. I follow that law. And what does Jesus say next? One thing you lack, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And why does he say that? Because it presses exactly on the part this guy was unwilling to do. It says about the young, rich young ruler, he went away sad because he had many possessions. He wasn't willing for that. Oh, goodness, tell me another law to obey. I'll be happy to do that one. But not this. Give up everything. Here Jesus presses on a very sensitive issue for the Pharisees, for Nicodemus here. He tells them that people need a spiritual birth, not merely a biological one. And he tells them that spiritual birth is dependent not upon works and good deeds and activity and effort, but upon the work of the Holy Spirit, unmanipulable, uncontrollable. So while it's understandable that Nicodemus would have a hard time getting this, right? Because all of his life, I'm a Jew and I do good things. Okay? Nevertheless, his ignorance is inexcusable. That's why Jesus challenges him with a kind of a mocking reply to his question. Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things? He calls him the teacher of Israel. He's known, he, he's known to be a well-educated, advanced Jew in some sense, whether that's kind of more just one of the Pharisees or it's unique to him. He ought to have known. He should have known better. These are elementary things. You should be ashamed of your denseness, Nicodemus. You're a teacher. Wait, hold on. Excuse me. You are the teacher of Israel. You don't understand these things. Later, he'll go on to call them earthly things. You know, much has been made about this line in history. As Christians have read through this, tried to unpack and understand it, it's wonderful for Christians to investigate hardcore little parts and pieces of every verse. People have wondered, what exactly is it about Jesus' teaching that should have been so obvious to this Pharisee? If he's talking about this as something that you as a teacher of Israel should know, that means that he expects that something in the teachings of Israel should be known by this guy. He doesn't go, well, you're not a surgeon, so I wouldn't expect you to know this part. He's telling him, you should know this. This is your area of expertise. So what is it in the Old Testament, which would have been the area of expertise for this person? What is it that Jesus is referring to here? Now, many have pointed back to Jesus' statement in verse 5 and said there's a connection. This is what he's talking about. He's trying to explain what it means to be born of water and spirit. Because whatever it is, Jesus must not be introducing a new thought. That much is true. Jesus isn't introducing new teaching and to go, well, of course you don't know this, Nicodemus. This is brand new. Write this down. Hear ye, hear ye. New information. No. Nicodemus should have known that you need to be born of water and the Spirit. Now, I'll just, I'll just tell you straight. I had had a solid page worth of uh, um, sermon notes that I was prepared to preach on this last week. I kicked it into this week. I told you last week, hey, I'll unpack this more when I get there because that'll give you the information at a later time. I think it'll be helpful. I had, I had planned to unpack it today, some of the views. I'm not doing that, though. Here's why. I actually think that might derail the point of what Jesus is saying here. The point that Jesus is making is that this should be incredibly easy to see. It's rudimentary. So I may actually drop those thoughts in the theology signal chat if you guys want to check those out this later this week. But just Consider why I made this decision to not unpack that theological debate. 
to unpack the details of a centuries-old theological debate with at least four distinct views would actually illustrate the exact opposite point that Jesus is making. This is simple. I didn't know any good way to unpack all the theology there and then try to te- tell you it's simple. So we'll save that for an, another venue. Jesus is stressing the simplicity of these truths. Nicodemus should have known these things. I think that a cursory reading of the Old Testament should have immediately made this evident to any person who reads it. I think a child who knows the Old Testament should have understood what Jesus was saying. That you need to be born again. Anyone familiar with God's Word should get it. And Jesus goes on to criticize Nicodemus' ignorance. He's not even yet giving an answer. He says in verses 11 and 12, Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. You don't receive it. If I had told you earthly things and you don't believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? So what's Jesus already been saying? Earthly things. Something that a teacher of Israel should definitely know. You should have this hip pocket ready to go. You should teach on this in a moment's notice. Hit pocket sermon, you might call it. Go. You need the spirit, spirit birth. Go. Preach on it, Nicodemus. He's like, wait, wait, what? What's that? Shame on you. He did not receive our testimony. Nicodemus has not trusted in Jesus. That word for testimony is the same word for witness. It's used back in John chapter 1. It actually points to John the Baptist back there, the first time it's used in this book. So John the Baptist had a testimony. Do you know what John the Baptist's testimony was? If you read that back in chapter 1, his testimony is, I'm not the Christ, but you need the Christ, and I'm not even worthy of him. That was his testimony. You need the Christ, not me, the Christ, the Messiah. You need Jesus, the anointed one. That was his testimony. But Jesus says that his testimony is better than that of John's. John 5.36, I'll just read it to you. Jesus says, the testimony that I have is greater than that of John, for the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. So what's Jesus' testimony? The works bear witness that I'm from the Father. John the Baptist says, you need someone who's from God? Jesus says, yeah, that's me. And the works that he does. Did John the Baptist do miracles? Not not technically, not that we're seeing there. He put people in the water and took them out. I do that every night with my kids. It's not a miracle. But what Jesus does is miracle. That's why, what happened when Nicodemus first interacts with Jesus in his introduction? He mentions the works, doesn't he? We know you must come from God because no one can do the works you're doing unless you're from him, right? Nicodemus already knows that. The problem was not in Nicodemus' eyes. He had seen the works Jesus had done. It wasn't in his ears. He'd heard the things that Jesus had been saying. But he did not believe the testimony of Jesus. He did not trust Jesus. He did not receive Jesus' testimony. You know, this is true in some measure of millions of our own neighbors, fellow Americans today, especially those in the Western world that have such great access to gospel and Bible and preaching and podcasts and books. We we just have so much access to that stuff. They see the work of God's hands in creation. They may have even heard the Word of God, experienced the Word of God. They may have even heard someone explain to them why why we celebrate Easter or Christmas. But they do not receive that testimony. You can be witness to some things without being witness to some things, so that makes sense, without having received those things. And Jesus goes on to indict Nicodemus on this charge. You've seen these things, you've heard these things, but you don't receive them. You won't. He says, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? It seems most likely what Jesus is saying there. Everything I've been saying, this is earthly stuff. It shouldn't be that hard for you. What does he mean by that, earthly things? 
Well, because well, while in one sense, everything Jesus has been talking about is heavenly and that it's spiritually true, it's not mere materialistic realities at play. It's more significant than that, of course. But it's earthly in that it's experienced here with us. Every one of you who is born again knows what it is to be born again. It's experienced here and now. It's not something we look forward to someday being born again in another place, in another time. Leon Morris is a commentator on on this particular passage. He says it this way. The new birth was taking place on earth and concerned a process with effects discernible on earth. That's the earthly thing. And here Jesus compares earthly things with heavenly things. He says, "If if you don't get the simple stuff, the earthly stuff, any true follower of God should know, how in the world are you going to understand if I were to tell you greater things? There are heavenly things. There are heavenly things. Things that are not able to be observed or experienced by us today. The kind of things that on a rare occasion, Old Testament even new, there are visions, revelations, glimpses, a spiritual realities, a uh, kind of pulling back of the veil to see things. And you ever read some of those accounts by Isaiah or Ezekiel, John in the New Testament, Daniel in the Old Testament? You read some of these accounts, and they're, they're having a hard time finding the words. So there's like a sea, but it's sapphires. But it's not, because it's, it's a sea. But then there's, there's someone seated on a throne, but I can't see him. I assume it's a him. Uh, he, he's, he, he's got these, uh, these creatures around them, they're flying, they have six wings, but the wings aren't flapping, there's there. There's all the weird stuff they talk, they can't explain it. They don't even know how to get to the bottom of it. Why? Because it's beyond our ability to comprehend. They're too wonderful to mention. This is true. This is why when you read through those passages, Old Testament and New Testament, you're like, I don't even know what to, I don't even know what to make of this. Jesus knows those things, the heavenly things. Things that you and I someday will be able to see and know, but today don't. And he could share some of those things with Nicodemus. He could do it. But if Nicodemus is unable to understand the simple things that anyone on earth should be able to understand, there's little hope that he will be able to bear anything more. That's the idea. Nicodemus, your little heart would burst if I told you more than this. And then Jesus adds this very interesting line in verse 13. It starts to turn the corner to what he's going to say in the rest of the chapter, rest of the conversation. Because at this point, Nicodemus has shut up. He's done. He's not talking anymore. Nicodemus is gone from this part of the story. You don't hear his voice ever again. Not until we get to chapter 7 and then 19. Jesus says, No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. I'm just going to try to explain this real quick to try to make sense of what it means, and then why Jesus put it here. First, this is the first time that Jesus mentions himself. You notice he already told what you need to enter the kingdom. What would you say if someone asked you how to enter the kingdom? You'd probably say, believe in Jesus, something like that. He didn't even mention his name yet. He's not talked about himself. He's not talked about belief. He's only said, you must be born of the Spirit. That's what Jesus has said so far. This is the first time he's now talking about himself. And he refers to himself as the Son of Man. It's common for Jesus to do. And he says something very interesting. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. What does he mean by this here? Well, Jesus is actually using a bit of common Old Testament language. There's a handful of places in the Old Testament that use this language. He's using Old Testament language because here we got this Old Testament scholar. At least this, Nicodemus should go, ah, okay, yeah, I, I, get, I know that. I want to read for you one place that this is used in the Old Testament. I think the clearest connection point here. It's in Deuteronomy 30. And it's during the time period where Moses is preparing to bring the wilderness generation uh, into the promised land. They've been 40 years there. They're coming uh, to the Jordan River. They're getting ready to cross over into the promised land, inherit the land that God had prepared for them, right? And on the way to do that, they stop to have a covenant renewal. And Moses repeats the whole law, make sure it's all repeated for them, they all know it, and then they, they have a moment where they get to respond and yes, we will receive this, yes, we will, uh, we, we will uh, bind into covenant with God in this. But he says something very interesting about the simplicity of the law, the old covenant here, in Deuteronomy 30, verses 11 through 12. He says this, for this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven 
that you should say, who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? And he goes on to explain how attainable it is to understand it. So what's Moses doing there? What Moses is saying is full well knowing that there will be people who someday will appeal to ignorance. Well, how could we? We, would, we need a messenger from heaven to tell us what it means to not kill my brother, how to not commit adultery, how, how I should not steal, how I should make a sacrifice if I sin. I don't, I don't understand that. Yes, you do. You don't need anyone else to come and tell you. You know it. Ignorance will not do. And some might try to claim that as an excuse, as a justification for disobedience. And Moses says, you know better. It is not too far off. Jesus uses this same language here. He uses this language of himself. I've ascended. I've descended. I do know all that stuff. I have come down. If you need anybody to tell you this stuff, it would be me. Notice the statement about his uniqueness here. No one other than Jesus has descended from heaven. Just as no one has ascended into heaven. I mean, known the knowledge of God that could be brought to mankind. John even, Jesus even says in John 8, he says, to, he says to these Pharisees again and a bunch of Jews, you're from below, I'm from above. You're of this world, I am not of this world. That's a theme in John also, a mini theme, a sub theme. Where Jesus talks about the uniqueness of himself over and above other created humans. He's not like them. He's the Word incarnate. So what Jesus is saying here is that there are certain things, heavenly things, that no one could be expected to know. That's true. Except for him. And he is confirming what Nicodemus said in his intro. Remember Nicodemus said, you're a teacher, come from God. He goes, yep, you're darn right. I sure am. I have come from God. I have descended from heaven. There really are high and lofty truths that are out of reach for us. There really are questions about heaven and the kingdom, heavenly things that Jesus could have blown his mind with, but he instead has told him earthly things, and Nicodemus should know these things. A few observations for you on this text. First, being familiar with God's word is not the same as having it in your heart. Being familiar with God's word is not the same as having it in your heart. Why was Nicodemus unable to understand what Jesus is saying? What was it that made it so hard for him to understand? I bet you he memorized more Old Testament than you and I. It was a tradition for, Old Test- for Pharisees to memorize huge portions of the Old Testament. In fact, to be a Pharisee, they likely had to memorize the first five books of the Bible. And not the fun ones. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Hard law stuff replete with names and lists of generations and land allotments. Nicodemus knew a lot about the Old Testament, didn't he? He knew his Old Testament inside and out. And as a Pharisee, he actually relied upon it. He actually would trust him. He actually point to it. How is it then he's not able to understand what Jesus is talking about here? You know, Paul actually answers this question about Jews I think really clearly in 2 Corinthians. I want to read for you something here. He's pointing back to a time in Moses' day again where Moses would go up to the mountaintop to talk with God to receive revelation to bring to the people. And when he comes down to talk to them, because he'd been with God, his face glowed. I don't know what that means. Shine? Like it would glow. That's what the language looks like. So it's like literally it's bright. All we know is that what he did to deal with the people is he veiled his face. He would literally put a veil over his face in order to talk with people until that slowly would wear off. Why would he do this? Because the people he was interacting with were so afraid they wouldn't even be able to be in interaction with Moses, a guy, because of his close proximity with God. And so he'd have to have a veil. They wouldn't get all of Moses. They certainly couldn't get all of God. This is what Paul says about that same idea. And he uses it as a kind of illustration about present day Jews, his day and ours. 2 Corinthians 3, 14 through 16. Their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the old covenant, that same veil remains unlifted. Because only through Christ is it taken away. 
Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Nicodemus still has a veil over his heart, over his mind. And even though he's in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, he has not turned to the Lord. He's there with them. He's talking with them. He's asking them questions. He's inquiring about things. He's hearing incredible, merciful truths. And yet, he still has a veil. That's why all of his knowledge of the Old Testament is useless regarding his eternal state. It is possible for a person to read the Bible, to memorize it, to trust the claims that it makes, to agree with the statements that they see there, and yet miss the most fundamental message. You could win a Bible trivia contest and not be a believer. People have done it. If you are depending upon anything other than God, you are missing the central message of the Old Testament and New. Here's the warning that comes from this. Like Nicodemus, you can read the Bible wrongly. You and I are utterly dependent on the work of the Spirit as believers every day in our lives. Even to rightly understand the Bible, even to know the truth of Scripture, we are dependent upon the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Utterly dependent. It was God who said, let light shine out of darkness. He has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for their folly to him. He is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Nicodemus is not able to understand, and yet his ignorance is no good excuse. You and I must learn to be utterly dependent on the work of the Spirit every day. We're just to read the Old Testament. What do we learn? What do you learn from the life of Moses? Techniques on how to get people out of slavery? No. Apart from the supernatural work of God, they're still slaves. When they get in front of the, of the, the, the Red Sea, and they know that the sea is in front and the enemy is behind, if God doesn't show up, they're all dead. Or slaves again. That's it. That's all there is to it. When they get into the wilderness, how do they survive? Do we learn from Moses? Ah, if you need water in the wilderness, hit a, rock with a, hit a rock with a staff. That's how you get water. No, to rely upon God. How do you eat when you're in the middle of nowhere? Rely upon God. You see, this is the whole story over and over and over repeatedly. You know why Moses didn't get into the promised land? Do you remember? Because he didn't obey God and give glory to God. The language is give glory to God in his obedience when God said, strike that rock one time and water will come out. And he struck it twice in anger. It's this little thing. You could almost miss it if you just read and pass the text. Why is that so significant? Because you are in some measure showing all of Israel you're relying on you, not me. That's huge. Why was it the people went back into the wilderness to live 40 years until an entire generation had to die out? Why? Because when they got to the promised land, they were prepared to walk in. They saw the big bad guys there and they were like, we're going to die. Oh, you think this was on you? What do we learn from David? How to slay Goliath? How to slay your giants? You know, there are actually fools today who've written books that have sold millions of copies on the whole point of David and Goliath. Well, David had the upper hand because he was throwing from a distance. A fool. It's not a how-to manual on how to slay giants. It's rely on God or die. What's the story of Gideon? What's the point of the story? 30,000 Israelite troops going against a a numerous horde of Midianites. God takes 30,000, whittles it down to 10, 10, 10,000, whittles it down to 300 and goes into battle. Why? To show them just how strong the Israelites were? No, the exact opposite. So that you will know it was me who won the war. 10,000 is too many. 
30,000 is too many. 300, that'll do. That we would learn there's a reliance upon God. Even think about people like Jonah. As you continue on, prog- progress through the Old Testament, you get to guys like this, and you, and, and you find a guy who has such a stubborn heart against these Ninevites, he doesn't even want to go to share the truth with them that they may be saved. Why? Because he's angry. God, if I preach repentance, they might repent. He's like, yeah, that's right, go. What's the story of Jonah when he finally arrives there at Nineveh? Is that he finally has a softness of heart? And because of the kindness and the goodness that he has, because of the love for neighbor, God works through this love for neighbor to save an entire city. No, that's not the story of Jonah. You see a stubborn kicking stones, repent or die. I would prefer the latter. And then God saves the entire city. This is not even dependent upon the heart of the evangelist. The whole of the Old Testament tells us the same story over and over and over again. And you could read the entirety of the Bible and miss it. Without God, we have nothing. And with everything apart from Him, misery. You and I must learn to depend wholly upon the work of the Spirit to work in our lives. This is every day. Brothers and sisters, this is right now, right now, every day. You have challenges in your marriage. You have challenges with your kids. You got challenges with other people in your life. You're trying to figure out how to deal with all of them. And some of them feel insurmountable. I don't know how to get over I don't. I just don't know. I, can't, I don't know what to do. You know, there's sometimes where it's just, there's no better place to finally get to than there. I don't know what to do. I have no idea. Nothing I would do will matter. You haven't found the right book on marriage yet, the right discipline technique with your kids that has worked. Ever think about this? If you could have a perfectly obedient child, all those, all those issues with your kid solved, they wouldn't have the Spirit of God in them. Would you want that? What does that help? What if, your, what if marital, marital peace could be restored tomorrow? Tomorrow. And all, immediately. Your spouse could begin acting and living exactly how you wanted. But internally, they hate God. Would you want that? What do you get if the Spirit of God doesn't move? You know, I remember when we came out to plant the mission church. And we arrived here in the big fanfare, all the trucks and trailers brought our stuff out. And we had a whole bunch of family and church members that came with us to kind of celebrate us coming. And we had left the church of thousands back in Illinois. And they were celebrating and singing praises to God. And we were up on a stage, laid hands on us and sent us to go. Just thousands of people uproaring and, and, and praising God and uh, uh, singing praises together and applauding. And we went out and finally, once we got here into the trailers, went back home, crickets. And you know the scariest thought that entered into my mind over that season. We could plant a church without God. I get chills thinking about it. You can plant a church without the Spirit of God. You can grow it huge. People do it all the time. Whole religions have been founded apart from the Spirit of God. Marriages have been healed apart from the Spirit of God. Conflict with external ma- ex- extended family members have come to some measure of peace apart from the Spirit of God. Is that what you want? You see, our only hope is that we cry out to Him to move. We need the wind. As a teacher of Israel, Not only should Nicodemus have known how utterly hopeless we are apart from God, he should also have known why it is that some people are ignorant of that fact. Hardened hearts. That should have scared him more than anything. Nicodemus should have immediately gone like, I don't understand. That scares me. Because this man is of God and I don't understand. I don't get what he's saying. Maybe that's why he shut up. Maybe that's why we don't hear from him again in this chapter. Maybe because the Spirit was doing a work right then, right then. And all of a sudden, 
He sat there with tears in his eyes and heard. I don't, I don't know if that happens. But he should be really worried, especially so because unlike you and me, he actually saw Jesus face to face. He watched the miracles. He saw them. And he still did not receive Jesus' testimony. But there's still hope for Nicodemus. As I said last week, he'll show up again in chapter 7, defending Jesus before the other Pharisees. Hey, don't be too quick to judge. Whoa, 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 whoa. Not too heavy-handed. We don't want to be against God here. And later in chapter 19, he'll show up after Jesus' death to bury his body. If anyone were to try to try to pawn off the lie to Nicodemus later in life, well, he didn't really die. He swooned. And then later his disciples brought him. He goes, no, I was there, man. I, I buried him. I put his body in the ground. Couldn't pass that lie off on Nicodemus. What a gift. I'm hopeful we'll see him with our Lord someday. And that this teaching will take root for him. The gospel is so simple. It's, it's earthly. It's, 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 we, we can attain it. If someone were to go to say to you, what must I do to be doing the works of God? How is it that a man can be saved? What should I do? We don't go, I don't, I don't know. We don't have to say that. We know. You must be born again. On your part, you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. It's not hard. You know, one time I had a, 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 fellow, a, a fellow neighbor over at my house, a Mormon who's an elders quorum president. This was in the earliest months of us arriving here in Utah, and uh, I hadn't yet read the Book of Mormon. I actually would end up reading it with him over, over time. And so I'm sitting there with him at my kitchen table. He's a well-respected guy, went on a mission. All of his kids were aiming towards that. His wife had gone on a mission. He was just kind of a poster boy for doing all the right things and, and his, his, uh, his faith. And as we sat there, he said, you just need to read the Book of Mormon. You need to read it. I said, okay, fine. I'll, I will. I'll actually read it with you. I'm curious to walk through it. I'd like to learn more about what you guys believe. Um, but let's just say I were to die tomorrow. Let's say I know that I'm going to die tomorrow. And let's say that I don't have the capacity to read this book you're holding out for me until tomorrow. You summarize it for me. What's your gospel? This guy, he, he opened up the Book of Mormon and he started going like this. Now, I, I, I let this simmer for about 20 or 30 seconds. And you guys know me. I'm a talker. That's like eternity for me. In a faith conversation to say nothing, I just sat there, like, waiting. 20, 30 seconds of me saying nothing, silence, and he just flipped through, flipped through, and finally he went like this. He sat it down and went, you know, maybe, maybe I suggest you talk to some missionaries who could answer that question for you. I'm going to die tomorrow in this scenario, and you don't, you don't have anything to give me. I said, the gospel is simple. A child can understand it. Turn yourself over to Jesus and be saved. You know, when Christians say, y'all need Jesus, that's what we mean. Y'all need Jesus, period, full stop, done. Well, what else? Nothing. That's the point. If you have Christ, you have everything. Without Christ, you have nothing. That's it. gospel is so simple, and yet it's hidden from some. As simple as it is, it's a shame to those whose hearts are hardened. How does this work? Why is it that some can't see or understand the gospel? What's going on with this Nicodemus? Heart veiled. That's the easy way you talk about it with an Old Testament Jew. Even people who know a lot about the Bible can be ignorant of the gospel. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4 says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. It's a spiritual condition. How do you undo that? The Spirit of God has to move. That's how. You're spiritually dead. You need to be made alive. Well, then what do we do? It says a verse before. We announced disgraceful and underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. By the open statement 
of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. What's the only thing we bring? Open statement. Why? Because if God doesn't work, it won't do anything. And if God does, it will do everything. We depend on the work of God, even in the advancement of the kingdom. It really is that simple. It really, really is that simple. When you prepare to talk to a non-believer about the gospel, you're going to go do some street evangelism. You've got some Mormon missionaries coming over this afternoon. You know you're going to see uh, some extended family coming to visit with you next week. And you're like, okay, we're going to have this conversation. I know I'm going to have this conversation. What do you do? How do you prep? You make sure you remember all the references. The heart is deceitful above all else, desperately wicked. Oh, where is that? Is that Ezekiel? Or is, that your, is that what you do? You pound through to make sure that as you're, you're saying those facts, you remember the dates right. The date of the Exodus, 1446, the date of the Exodus. No, that's not probably what you're doing. You cry out to God, Lord, if you don't move, if you don't work, if you don't act, their heart will stay hard. And this will fall on deaf ears. That's what we pray. Matthew 18, 3. Jesus says this, truly I say to you, and this is great because great the language is similar to what he says in John 3 about entering the kingdom. Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Why children? Because they're not sinful? They're sinful. Kids rely on others. More natural for them. Everything in their life is relying on somebody else. The littler they are, the more they rely. It's exhausting being a parent sometimes. They rely on you for everything, everything. You and I should rely upon the Lord in a very similar way. You know, the gospel is not hard to understand. A little kid can get it. My four-year-old's a theologian. She, Kayla, little Kayla, sweet, cute little blonde here. We call her an elf princess because she has kind of elfish features. She's so, she has the cute little voice that we're like, we'd never want that voice to go away. She, uh, she's, she's the one who has this little kind of attitude issue going on right now that she'll just look over at her little brother and she'll look at me and she'll look at the brother, she'll reach over. She'll just pinch him. If you have kids her age, she's probably pinched them. And I, we had a discipline moment where I, I took her into the other room, I sat her down in a chair, I was sitting across from her, and I was like, why do you keep doing this? And she looked at me with her weepy little big lip, and she said, maybe God gave me a mean heart. I said, well, what do we need to do? We need to ask him for a new one. She knows more than Nicodemus. <laughs> Did Nicodemus not know it? Did he not hear the words of David? Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Had he not memorized the words of Ezekiel? Speak to the valley of dry bones that it would come to life. Did he not know in song the words that the heart of stone had to be removed and a heart of flesh put in. Foolish Nicodemus, you should have known. You needed a new life. Brothers and sisters, you need a new life. You need a new one. If you're not a believer today, it's what you need. You need a whole overhaul of your soul from beginning to end. You need to come to spiritual life like a new birth, born again. You have repented of your sins and turned in faith to Jesus is what you need to do because somebody had to be punished for the sins that you have done. It's easy. You do wrong things, you get punishment. You've done wrong things. What's the punishment? What's the wage for your sin? It's death. It's what you deserve. And it's why every single person on this earth dies. It's why. So how are you going to deal with that? What's your solution? Easy. Have somebody else die for you. Lord Jesus Christ is our perfect sacrifice. He goes to the cross to die. Not for his own sins, because he didn't do any. For our sins. That if you believe on him, 
you too will have eternal life. And why is it that after he dies and goes into the grave, he comes back to new life? So that every, there's lots of reasons we can unpack for forever on this. It's glorious. But to show you need new life, a new life that can never die again. And that's exactly what you'll get if you believe on him. You need to embrace the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Stop relying on anything else, your lineage, your heritage, the fact that you go back to a Jewish family, maybe way back in the day, I could trace myself back to some line through some covenant promise. No. Well, I had some, I had some parents who were Christian. Er, wrong. Not through your blood. Well, I've done a lot of good things. Er, not through your works. Stop it. You're doing what Nicodemus did. Stop it. That's a modern day Pharisee. What do you need to do? You need to rely on God entirely, entirely for the mental faculties to believe. The words coming off of your lips to confess. Everything needs to be a reliance upon Him. Everything. And then in your life, just keep doing that for forever. And then join with your new brothers and sisters in rejoicing in the simplicity of the gospel. Rejoice in it. And I'd say this for anyone here. If you couldn't adequately explain the gospel to a four-year-old, you may be overcomplicating it in your heart. That doesn't mean you don't know it. You may be overcomplicating it. You may have been letting some things get in the way of that. We talk about this all the time, but seriously, if you want to see how wise you are, how mature in the faith you are, go teach the four-year-olds. We'll see how wise you are real quick. When they come up and ask you some really hard questions and all of a sudden you're like, I don't even know how to say that to a kid, then you don't really know. It's really easy to point to the top shelf and say, I know a lot of stuff up there. Really? Prove it. Take it down. That's a plug for children's ministry, by the way. Help out there. Seriously. You learn to explain the gospel to a child. You can explain it like Jesus. Brothers and sisters, our reliance on the Holy Spirit doesn't stop at conversion. It has to continue every day of our lives. My prayer, my eager, my earnest prayer for this church is that we'd be a spirit-filled people who rely on Him for everything. Who when someday people say, how do you live a life for Christ? At the end of your life, if you were to write that book, you'd say, trust in Him for everything. I got nothing else. How do you plant a church? Trust in Him. How do you get saved? Trust in Him. How do you heal a marriage? How do you fix problems with kids? How do you deal with issues in your neighborhood? Trust in Him. And every good work that you will do as a result of your trust in Him will have a fruitfulness attached to it that it couldn't otherwise. This is my prayer for our church. Let's pray it right now. Father, I love my brothers and sisters. I want, I want our family to grow. I want more brothers and sisters. But I want all of us to be a family that's in utter reliance upon you. Father, Son, Spirit. Father, we rely on you. Let us not for a moment become so foolish that we forget how utterly hopeless life is apart from you. Lord, help us to proclaim salvation to the lost in utter dependence upon you. Let us teach others how to be utterly dependent upon you. Let us never for a moment think that we found a solution apart from, outside of you. Lord, let us not fall for the foolish lie that we can do an end run around your work and still find fruit. Lord, we don't want any part of that kind of fruit. We want truth. I pray this congregation would cry out for it, would ache for it, and we'd be a people who even when we open the Bible, we open the Bible with dependence. That, on, on, that when, we, when we first open the Bible, the first five minutes will be wiping tears out of our eyes. As we orient ourselves to that passage in the Bible, we'd be so overcome by the fact that we don't deserve to even read that truth that we couldn't even begin to understand it in our natural selves. It wasn't the equipping of the Holy Spirit in the moment. Oh, Lord, let it just aid our worship every single day. Let our kids see it and watch it in us. They would crave it, that they'd want it too, and you'd use even that in order to bring about their conversion. Lord, all of it's on you. So teach us to trust in you and to love trusting in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.